Now, you all know about what happened in Toulouse at the Jewish school. Does anybody need to be refreshed? Everyone knows. So since the murders of the three children and the rabbi um, in Toulouse, violent anti-Semitism, violent Jew hatred, um, has increased in France 45% from what was already a high, high number. Um, the film was released in, um, on October 24, 2011 at the Paris Theater in Manhattan and since then it's been screening throughout South Africa, North America. It had its, it had its Latin American premiere in Buenos Aires on November 15th and is now screening throughout Argentina and Ecuador and some other Latin American countries. It's been translated into Arabic, French, German, Hebrew, Italian, Portuguese, um, Russian and Spanish, and we'll be doing world tours, uh, you know, soon, uh, like next month. Um, and it's being shown in uh, theaters, in community centers, in synagogues and churches. Um, and the intent of the film, the reason I made the film was, um, the film was really made as a, a tequila gudola, as a as a, a blast, a call to action, as a you know a sound as a, a sound of an alarm that we wake up. That as Erwin Kotler said in the film, that we not only strengthen our moral clarity, but also our moral courage to stand up to this hate and to fight it. And now I'd like to hear from you. Any questions or um, or comments? What is your background as far as uh, documentary filming? Is this a hobby or this is something you've so moved as far as there being none of this out there that you were compelled to? Right. Create? So my my background is um, I'm 62 years old, so I had the opportunity to do, try a lot of different things. So in my past, I've been, you know, I've been very involved in media. Um, I, and in addition to being involved in media, um, I was a director for adult Jewish learning for Combined Jewish Philanthropies, which is Boston's Jewish Federation. I, um, and I was the executive director of an Israel advocacy organization called the David Project. Uh, I've been a strategy manager for the Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education. So I've been involved in, in education and in advocacy. And what I came to realize after many years of, of work in these areas was that film is a very important way of educating um, wide, wide uh, spans of, of, of people. And so in 2007, I founded Document Productions, which is a nonprofit organization with the mission of uh, creating, producing, and disseminating educational resources uh, to strengthen Jewish identity, Jewish peoplehood, and the values of freedom and democracy. So it wasn't until, it wasn't until I was 56 years old that I started full, you know, I started doing film and it hasn't been until the past year where it is only what I do. Did you have a question? Yes, it's, it's difficult to know how to combat it because you say when you get missed off from Gaza, no one says a word and they, in a way, see it as completely acceptable. What, you know, what can you do? You have to, you have to, that's a very good question. Um, the, the first very important step is to have the courage to acknowledge what is happening. And then once you have the courage to acknowledge what's happening and to name it, then you have to stand up and you have to say it doesn't matter. It doesn't, ultimately it doesn't matter if I'm perceived as being politically incorrect, if my friends don't invite me over for Shabbat dinner anymore, or don't want to hang out with me, because in the end we have to stand as people with integrity and dignity. And to stand with integrity and dignity today is to stand up to say there is in fact evil in the world. And I am not going to be complicit 
in the spread of evil by being silent. Um, on a tactical basis, there's a lot of different things that, that, that can be done. And if Doc Emmett just, Doc Emmett Productions just released this morning a 65-page activist guide called With Clarity and Courage, an activist guide which is the companion to this. If you go to the film's website, www.unmaskthemovie.com, you can uh, you go to the, the tab that says Learn More and you can download it for free or you can read it on, uh, on the web and it will suggest a lot of different things that can be done to combat this. But again, the most important step is that first step, which is to have the courage to see that lethal Jew hatred, the intent of murdering the Jewish people and the Jewish collective, um, is, has resurged throughout the world, and we, 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 we must fight it. Yes? I just, yeah, I'm obviously fascinated, um, and I'm very emotional when I read the newspapers in this country now with what's happening. I think it's very one-sided. But it would have been interesting to hear people who were non-Jewish, possibly. There were non-Jews in the film. Okay, okay so um, the first person uh, after Ellie was up, Catherine Chatterley. Uh, who directs the Canadian Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism. She is not Jewish. Well, has, and there, has there been a reaction from people who are Jewish who've seen this who said, I agree, I feel there's anti-Semitism? What has been the reaction of mm -hmm. people who've seen this that are yeah. Jewish? Okay, but I, I just want to also, Catherine is not the token Gentile in the film. There are many others. Uh, James Wool, uh, Jim Woolsey, who is a former CIA director for the United States, he's not Jewish. Ambassador John Bolton is not Jewish. Matthias Kunzel is, is a non-Jewish German. I mean, and, and there are others. Um, and I intentionally... You can't label it, can you? Like, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I didn't want to present them as the tokens. But, um, okay, so the response of, of... Yes, I go into churches. As an example, the day after Rosh Hashanah, I had been invited to go to Christ Episcopal Church, who, who co-sponsored with St. Paul's Episcopal, Episcopal Church in Poughkeepsie, New York, and there were 250 Christians, Episcopalians, not Evangelicals, Episcopalians in the, in, in the church, who watched the film and then spoke with me, and they were traumatized because they didn't, you know, even, even, people who know basically everything in the film, and most people don't know everything that was in the film, uh, to see it all together is, 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 can be shocking, or at least stunning. And uh, their, their reaction it, it is the reaction that I get all the time, which is, what can we do? I mean, it was one of the questions that came up to me. Last night, I was in Birmingham. I was at a synagogue in Birmingham, and 50% of the audience, if not more, were Christians. And it was the same thing, like, what can we do? And it's important for them uh, to ask what they can do because they have to deal with the fact that their church leaders aren't telling them um, that as we're sitting here, there are Christians who are being murdered on a daily basis in Muslim countries. In the same way, unfortunately, and I, I wish I didn't have to say that, that there are also leaders in the Jewish world who aren't telling us what's happening and are even uh, in the more progressive segments of the Jewish world are point to people like me and others and say, oh, they're Islamophobic or don't listen to them, they're hate mongers. We are not hate mongers, we are not Islamophobic. We love life and we hate evil and we're trying, to, we're trying to wake people up. And I make a distinction between Muslim people and radical Islamists. There are some moderate Muslims in the world who have the courage to try to fight the Islamist ideologues. There are not enough moderate Muslims to do that. There needs to be more. It is not our responsibility for a reformation to happen in the 
Islamic world. That's their responsibility. Our responsibility is to make sure that our Western leaders do not appease tyrants. And I think everyone in the room knows what I'm pointing to. Because every time a Western leader appeases a tyrant, it stabs the moderates in the back. And it says to the moderates, we don't care about you. And they know it, and they remain silent then. Yes? Uh, why do you think there is such, uh, so, there is so much hatred against the Jews and that people feel so uh, passionately uh, uh, anti-Jewish and, and had this hatred for uh, so long? I don't think that there's one answer to that. I think that there's a, a lot of aspects to that. I mean, so what I do want to say, though, is that um, the Jewish people represent something very unique in the world. Uh, there's, there's a non-Jew by the name of George Gilder who wrote a book called The Israel Test. And his, his um, prep, his, he contends that it's due to envy. Um, that may be one reason. I don't think it's the only reason. I think also that there's been a history, a track record that's been established that we're easy game, that the world loves to us when we're dead. They like to have memorials for us. They like to talk about all those, you know, the poor Jews, but they don't like it when we fight back. Uh, and unfortunately, there have been pathologies that have developed in the Jewish world because of our long history and because of not having enough strength to be able to stand up and, uh, to that hatred and say, you know, you're talking about yourself, you're not talking about us. And there are too many, unfortunately, there's too many Jews who don't have self-awareness who let that hatred seep in and turn it into self-hatred and then they become collaborators. But we, every people have a long history of having collaborators. It's just that when we have collaborators, it has a very intense consequence. We could go back to the three to, We could go back to the spies. We could go back to Paolo Cristiani in the debate with Nachmanides. We could go back to stuff that happened during the 30s and 40s. And we could look at today. Um, you know, that's why, that's why I flashed some people who are technically Jewish, who are some of our worst enemies. But that's just the way it is, and we can't let that trip us up. But we do need to recognize who our allies are and who our enemies are. Unfortunately, some of our enemies are among our people. Who had the next question? Yeah. Um, so it seems there what you're showing about France and how um, when everything happened with the synagogue there that the French government said there are two communities against one another and the French people were seeing kind of the Jews and the Muslims kind of in the same light. Recently with what's happened in Israel I've had comments at work that they see the Jews and the Muslims the same, both terrible people, both terrorists, what's the difference kind of view. How do you suggest that the Jews or the media informs people of the difference? Because sometimes people see them as much of the same. People who see Jews and, and Islamists as the same are complete idiots. I agree with you. And it's but, but there's a lot of them out there. Well, you know, I mean, if people, you know, but that, that it's a very convenient thing for them to be able to do that. And one of the things that we need to do is to not be silent. So it's, it's pretty clear that when the media, you know, talks about Israel's response in a way that's not even a response, you have to stand up and you have to talk. You have to talk one-on-one -on -one to people, your colleagues, whether your friends, your family, your, your, your peers. Your, you know, you, you have to not be afraid of being looked at as, as a politically incorrect, you know, fascist. And you just have to speak truth, because when we don't speak truth, the silence validates the lies are being said. But we are not, we are not the same as, as, as 
people who are intent on, uh, who have genocidal intent, because that is not the intent of the Jewish people and it is not the intent of the Jewish state. The Jewish state needs to be more militant. From my, my position, I think even the Jewish state is being a little pathological and letting too much happen and not responding enough. Do you see uh, the situation in Syria, where well, last time I heard about 40,000 people killed? Clearly, if we're looking to prevent injustice, the world seems to be somewhat silent about what's going on. There's a lot of people who have been killed. The world doesn't care really about genocide. It, the, the, the world is so focused on, on deflecting all of their deficiencies and their pathologies onto Jews. And you know, it's to the advantage of all of these um, totalitarian regimes that everybody, look at who's on the Human Rights Council. It, 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 we live in a, you know, Melanie Phillips wrote a very important book called The World Turned Upside Down. And indeed, we live in a world that's turned upside down. I mean, it's crazy. You know, and, and the U, you know, when the UN was started, you know this, when the UN was started, it was started with it when there was a majority of democratic uh, countries, it was actually started so that something like the Holocaust would never happen again. We now have an institution that's trying to work as hard as it can to ensure that there will be another Holocaust. Hi. Sorry, um, just to follow up on, on a question about what, how we can relate our story to yes. non Jews. I was yes. at the House of Lords yesterday, the Council of Jews and, and Christians, and the Ambassador of Israel was speaking. He's very good and he can quote scripture, which, you know, for a lot of the uh, uh, religious uh, Christians there, you know, priests, yeah. the priesthood, they actually love yeah. that. Uh, the point being, um, we do have friends, and I think some of us um, have forgotten that um, maybe we're embarrassed by garnering the support of Christians in Europe, but we do have a base in you know, the United to. So that's that point. Um, what I wanted to say is a very interesting film. As a fellow filmmaker, I make documentaries and you're dealing with you know, the murky Nazi issues of anti-Semitism, which I've also dealt with. Uh, and you've, you know, it's, it's a great film. The way that you've um, uh, devised it in different themes. You know, was there, I mean, I can speak about the editing. If you, I mean, you could, it must have been a crazy edit. You know, there's so many ways in into this subject matter that I'm not going to ask a sort of technical question. It's sort of, was there a common denominator running through? You, you spoke to almost all the world experts in this field, you know, Anne Bajewski, mm -hmm. uh, Hilal, uh, Nirvana, and mm -hmm. uh, Dershowitz. And so you're sitting there, you're listening, so it's a two-pronged question. Was there a common denominator, and uh, and it was there meaning? Was there something that struck you that everyone was saying? Um, and uh, was there some kind of um, at, at the end of that process? How did you feel? Did you feel sort of positive? Did you feel that there's okay, all these Jews, interested in non-Jews? Do we it, could we find a solution? So that's that's kind of the two questions. Okay, so the, the, way that, the way that I went, I'm, I'm going to answer it sort of in a roundabout way that will, I think, give you the answer. Um, when, when, I, when I sit down to, uh, to start a new documentary project, I do not start with a storybook. I don't write a script. I don't start with a script because if it's a documentary and I start with a script, then all I'm doing when I go out to interview is trying to prove my script. So I don't do that. So what I do is I, I do research and then I identify what the critical issues that need to be addressed about what the film is about, right? And once I have the critical issues laid out, then I next research who are the world authorities on each of those issues. Then, after I finished the research, I interviewed 70 experts from almost every continent in the world. I only used 
49 of them, and I know that that's a lot, and it's to say only 49 is crazy, I know, but I interviewed 70 from every continent, and I interviewed Jews, Christians, Hindus, and Muslims. Now, and I'll share something with you that I don't often put in, say, to, to the public. I couldn't use, I, I had actually interviewed um, the former president of the Supreme Court of India. And I couldn't use any of the interview because Hindu leaders seem to be very, very um, clear about what's going on. And they will come out and say, we just have to kill them. And that is too, it, that, we're, you know, you can't, you can't have something like that to the Western world. I mean, it offends our sensibilities. So I couldn't use his stuff. I kept on saying to him, are you sure you want to say that because you're on camera? And he said, there's nothing else to say. We have to kill them. Now, I don't necessarily agree or disagree. I'm not going to say where I stand on that. All I knew is I couldn't put it in the film. But I do know that uh, it is, we are, we, we know from our, from our tradition that we are, not, we are not Christians. We are not supposed to turn the other cheek. So anyway, so that's why we didn't have the Hindu voice in here. Uh, the reason why we didn't have the Muslim voice in here is because the Syrian Muslim from, who is in exile in Germany, who I interviewed, who's a very courageous scholar, told me at the end of the interview that he couldn't sign the release because he had just gone through when he first agreed, he said, you know, I thought that this would be a more superficial interview. He said, I just went through this period of time where I got daily phone calls from Islamists threatening to rape my wife. I can't do it again. And I offered, then I went to Khaled Abu Tawma, who's an incredibly courageous journalist. I begged him three times, and he said, Gloria, I can't do it. It's too dangerous. He used to do documentaries. He can't do it anymore. But that's why you don't have the moderate Muslim in here. But I don't, you know, I'm also opposed to, to I, you know, I don't need non-Jewish voices in the film to give us credibility. I just don't. Um, but it was really informative for me in the research project to get those interviews done. So did that answer, oh, so what did I, what, what happened to me after spending 23 intensive months only thinking about the resurgence of lethal Jew hatred in the world. Um, it was very intense. I mean, it was, it was personally tra transformational. I mean, I have to say that I grew up, I thank God that I grew up with a father who told me all the time when I was a little girl that if there's ever a threat to the Jewish people or the, 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 or, or the state of Israel, that you go and fight. Now, there were other gender issues, like he didn't think I could change the doorbell or, dri or drive a manual car, but he had no hesitation that he wanted his little girl to be able to go fight if, if we were threatened. And I thanked him for that. That's how I was raised, and that's how I've tried to raise my children. So it's not like this was the first time I realized that, you know, they want to kill us. Um, but it was, um, it was, it, it made me a little bit nuts about like why is, yeah, you know, I had to like calm down, you know, because I would think every day, why isn't everybody looking at this? Why isn't, how could anybody think about anything else? We've got to deal with this. And then the other thing that happened for me was, you know, I, I, I really had been confused for many decades about what, what were Jews in North America doing when European Jews were being gassed and burned in ovens. And how could this have happened? Now, I have to say that there, there, are, there are quite a few executive directors of federations in North America that have been inviting me to come into their communities to show the film and speak with them, but there's still many that don't. And there are many rabbis in the progressive denominations that refuse to bring this into their synagogues because it's Islamophobic. And you know, my response to that is, 
if, the, if it was the 1930s, or no, if the film was about, if the film was about neo-Nazis, they wouldn't have a problem with me showing it. Because neo-Nazis are white. And it, it's not a question of being politically correct. And all of this stuff I know sounds disgusting, and you can say, oh wow, you know, she's this crazy right-wing person, but I'm not a crazy right-wing person. This is reality. So I, I finally got, I finally got how it happened. I finally got how it happened that there was an outrage and riots, not riots because we don't riot, but like huge marches in the street when the St. Louis was told to turn around and take the Jewish passengers on board back to the ovens. Anything else? I yeah. just want to know about the responses of people. For example, let's say someone has a deep-rooted... A lot of people, are, first of all, a lot of people are indifferent. They don't really care about Israel or what Jews mean in the world. And they're very, very much against... Them. They don't care. But then, there, have you ever met people who may have, let's say, taken side with the Palestinian cause and then looked at it a little bit deeper and then changed their minds? There is... There is a... Um, there's a Palestinian who's the son of a terrorist who has been touring Europe and, and, and North America talking about how he was raised to hate Jews and want to kill Jews and one day he picked up Alan Dershowitz's book, The Case for Israel. Sure, sure. So there's him. But that's just... No, no, but no. And there, there, are, there, are, there are some others. And in the United States, there are, there are, there are, there's been a handful, of, of, handful that I know of. So but the more, you know, the question is, it's safer to do it in the United States than in Europe or in the Middle sure. East. But Khaled Abu Toma is a great example. He exposes corruption in the PA. He exposes the lies about abuses of Israeli Arabs. He talks about how, about the surveys that have been done of Israeli Arabs at, when they're asked, if, if there is a Palestinian state where would you choose to live, in Israel or a Palestinian state? And the majority of them say, are you out of your mind? We're going to stay in Israel. Because they know what it's like to live in Gaza. They know what it's like to live in an Islamic country. So, did that answer? Yeah, okay. I guess. All right. I'd like to thank Gloria. I must tell you that we've had two of the people here, uh, Hilo Moya and uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz. Mm -hmm. um, we apologize for uh, the very small crowd that's here tonight. Uh, oh, it was our week's notice. It's a very yeah. short notice, and I do hope that next time, uh, please, when you are producing a film, you'll let us know yes. uh, uh, well, some time before so that we can properly uh, um, thank you. publicize this. And uh, we want to wish you success in what is a very important work that you're doing. Thank you. Can I just say that the next film project is a film that ex examines the historical connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel? And I would tell you, we'd be delighted to host a uh, here today, a hearing on. Thank you. I'll be in touch with my sister. Thank you. So thank you very much. And, uh,